All right, welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Kyle O'Connell from the University of Texas at Arlington. Today I'm going to be talking about island diversification on the island of Sumatra. So I'm broadly interested in diversification across the island of Sumatra, but to begin to think about the processes that have driven diversification on Sumatra, we need to look at Sumatra in the broader geographic context. So Sumatra is part of the geographic unit, the Sunda Shelf, shown here at the four land masses, Sumatra, Java, Peninsular Malaysia, and Borneo. So the Sunda Shelf is a really interesting place to study diversification because it's undergone a very dynamic geological and climatological history. So Sumatra and Java lie kind of at the, the boundary point of two tectonic plates that as they've collided and created uplift, which has pushed up the Barisan mountain range along the western edge here with the Banda Arc. Uh, you've also had really long-standing or long-term <coughs> tropical highland refugia where you've had these highlands in Borneo, Malaysia, and Sumatra that have remained wet and tropical for as long as the last 25 million years. But despite this long-standing tropical situation in the highlands, you've had a lot of turnover in the lowlands. So during the Miocene, much of the lowlands were underwater. Into the Pliocene, or into the Pli Pliocene and Pleistocene, you had a lot of cooling and drying. And so what's tropical today may have been savanna or pine forests. So we've had kind of this two situations where we've got long-standing isolation in the highlands, but a lot of turnover in the lowlands, as well as volcanoes along those mountain ranges, created a very dynamic area to study diversification. So in my mind, there's kind of two primary time points in the history of Sumatra that have most greatly influenced diversification, kind of gives us these alternative hypotheses to test. So between the top figures 20 and 15 million years, between 20 and 10 million years really, most of Sumatra was underwater. So there were these inland seas that covered most of the island, and what would have remained would have been these sort of micro islands that were mountaintops. And any species that was distributed across Sumatra during that 10 million year time period would have been isolated into these fragmented mountaintop habitats that, remember, remained wet and tropical, but wouldn't have allowed dis dispersal between them. And likewise, in the 10 and 5 million years, we see most of Sumatra begins to, to emerge out of the ocean, become land positive. But over time, that the, those lowlands are cooling and drying. We also see a little bit of connectivity between Borneo and Sumatra and the emergence of some highlands that are a little bit higher than the rest of the mountains in, the, in southern Sumatra and long-standing highlands in Borneo. As we move into the Pleistocene, most of the last 1 to 2 million years, the Sunda Shelf has been one land unit. So all this light gray, uh, the, the darker gray is the current land masses, and light gray is Pleistocene land connection bridges. So there are these land bridges that connected basically all of the Sunda Shelf. But despite this connectivity that would have would have permitted uh, dispersal for a lot of larger mammals and birds, a lot of dispersal limited species may not have been able to cross these land bridges because a lot of this lowland area was dry and cool, maybe had long running savanna patches, and was intersected by these large rivers. So during the Miocene, remember we've had inland seas, we have long standing uh, tropical conditions in the highlands, and then we have the potential for dispersal during the Pleistocene, but it may not have been ideal for dispersal limited species. So to understand how all these processes have been working together to influence diversification on Sumatra, I've chosen a genus of frogs called Rachophorus. Rachophorus have 90 species distributed across Asia, so from India to Indonesia and up into China. They're foam nesters, so they all, multiple males, one female, they make these big foam nests and then the tadpoles fall into the water. They're kind of famous for being gliding frogs. So Wallace described Wallace as flying frogs that live in the canopy, these big green frogs with very extensive hand webbing. But most of them actually have fairly limited hand webbing. You can see they're, they're not really equipped to glide. Most of them live about a meter off the ground. And most of the species are actually stream dependent. So they breed in streams. And this stream dependence likely influences their population structure. But not all of the genus is stream dependent. So there may be some differences in their habitat use. Within Sumatra, there's 12 to 14 species of Rakophorus. Eight of them are endemic, so we have high levels of endemism on Sumatra. And four of those endemic species are restricted to the highlands. So you can see three of the highland restricted species here. Most of the species on Sumatra are, are in the phylogeny, distributed kind of throughout the phylogeny. So most of them are sister to a species from either Borneo or Peninsular Malaysia and are the result of some sort of a dispersal event and an allopatric diversification. However, these colored branches here represent an endemic in situ lineage 
or clade within Sumatra. So you have four species that diversified in situ on Sumatra, then one that diversified on western Java. And so this represents in situ diversification within Rocophorus in this group. And I've chosen three of these five in situ species as my focal taxa. So these three are co-distributed in the range maps across most of Sumatra. Rocophorus catamitus has the widest range and Modestus is a little bit more restricted. And interestingly enough, when we were out collecting these things on mountaintops, sometimes it seemed like they partitioned the microhabitat. So Catamitus might be found along a stream and post a notice in a pond that was nearby. And other times, especially when we collected lots of juveniles, we'd find them kind of climbing all over each other. So it's possible that they're partitioning microhabitat with different areas, and it may be that they're not. We're not quite sure how they're co-distributed in St. Patrick. So I've asked three specific questions using these three focal taxa to understand diversification on Sumatra. The first is sort of a time question. When did Rocophorus diversify? If we can understand kind of a temporal framework, then we, then we know already the different processes that were occurring in the Miocene, Pliocene, and Pleistocene. This will give us an idea of what could have driven diversification. Second, if we take a comparative framework or comparative approach among those three species. We see concurrent patterns across species indicating that island-wide processes have driven diversification, or do we see discordant patterns in our comparisons across population structure indicating that life history traits or life history differences have driven diversification in each of these three species? And finally, if we look at gene flow patterns across the island, does, do gene flow patterns indicate that once a species dispersed across the island, there was actually lots of dispersal later during the Pleistocene and contemporary gene flow? Or do we see long-standing isolation indicating that once things were isolated on mountaintops, they weren't able to disperse later? So I generated three molecular data sets to get at these questions. The first is a 16S data set with all the recoffers available on GenBank and population sampling for my focal taxa, as well as everything from Sumatra. Uh, I generated almost complete mitochondrial genomes for four species from Sumatra, including these three focal taxa. And then I used RADseq uh, to generate a RAD data set, nuclear data set for 31 individuals, including those three focal taxa that I'll present the most widespread one to you today. So jumping into the results, I used BEAST to estimate phylogeny and divergence times. And we can see a few patterns emerge right away among these three species. So first, I colored the branches north, central, and south. So red are the northern clades, central are green, and southern clades are blue. And we can see that in each of the three species, we have this concurrent phylogenetic structure of northern, central, and southern clades. We can also see that there's one difference here. post the notice, this group diverged a little bit more recently than the other two species. And we can see that the central clade diversified or split off of the northern and southern clade first. But these divergence times are really close <coughs> together in their estimates. And when you estimate phylogeny in RAXML in a likelihood framework, you see that the branch lengths are really, really short. So I'm not very confident in this. So I think the big takeaway here is that we see this concurrent three population structure across the three species. In terms of divergence times, we see that this deeper split here where the two lineages diverged in the NC2 group is between 14 and 26 million years. So that would put these deeper species level splits during the time when the inland seas covered Sumatra. Likewise, within species, we see these splits, the big split between north and south, where the first split in each species is between five and 15 million years. So this is like, likely after the inland seas were covering Sumatra during the Miocene, but it would still put divergence between the late Miocene or early Pliocene. And then I also used the complete mitochondrial genome data set that I had to sort of calibrate these deeper species level nodes or the relationships between species. And my mean values for complete mitochondrial genomes were actually on the lower end of the, of the confidence intervals for 16S. So this indicated that 16S is likely overestimating divergence times, but it still puts divergences even within species long before the Pleistocene. And the final thing I'll show you here is I plotted my localities and these clades on the map. The shapes represent different species shown next to the cutouts, and then the colors correspond to southern, central, and northern. And we can see that there's this really clear split between the northern clades and the central and southern clade, but that there is a little bit of uh, 
uncertainty about the boundary between the central plane and the southern plane. So there's some discordance among the three species. So this indicates that perhaps there's been some gene flow between the central and the southern plane, and that that, that phylogenetic break or whatever, whatever feature is separating those clades is not quite as strong as the break between north and south. So I also generated rat seek data for Rocophorus catamatis, which is the most widespread of the three species. And we can see that I ran structure here, and we see this, this same northern, central, and southern population structure. We can see that there's potential introgression between the southern and central plane, which kind of corresponds to that picture we're seeing in the mitochondrial data, where the boundary between the central and southern groups was not quite as, as strong. And you can see I plotted the general sampling localities here. And then I used this program EEMS, which is Estimated Effective Migration Surfaces. So this is a new program that you can think of sort of as plotting population structure in a geographic context. So it estimates effective migration across the landscape by looking at pairwise, pairwise dissimilarity between sampling localities, and then it finds places where the pairwise distance dramatically drops off, and it plots that as a, as a discontinuity or a phylogenetic break. And then I plotted my individual sampling localities with these open circles, and it also estimates diverse, diversity rates. So areas of high gene flow or high diversity are going to be in blue. Areas of low gene flow or low diversity are going to be in orange or red. So when we look at the migration rates across the island for contaminants, you can see that we have high estimates of migration in the north around Lake Toba. We see this big split between north and central and south, which corresponds to structure and the mitochondrial data. And then we see low levels of gene flow in the central plane and moderate levels of gene flow in the southern plane. And we see kind of a smaller break or split between the central and southern plane. So this all kind of corresponds to what we've been seeing all along here. And then as far as diversity, we see very low levels of diversity in the north around Lake Toba with high levels of diversity in the central plain. And this could indicate that the eruption of Lake Toba could have wiped out everything in the north. And so this is kind of a, a, a more recent clade. And so we see lower levels of genetic diversity. Or it could be that that large phylogenetic split between north and south has kind of isolated the individuals in the north. And then we see this high level of diversity in the central plane, which could represent some sort of a, uh, a contact point between the central and southern groups. So to summarize, we found that Rocophorus diversified during the late Miocene, early Pliocene, likely after the inland seas, but long before the Pleistocene, when we saw all those big land bridges among the Sona Shelf. We see island-wide processes drove diversification rather than species-specific histories. So we saw a very concurrent population structure among the comparisons that we made in the species. And then finally, when we look at gene flow across the island, we see long-standing isolation among populations. And so during the Pleistocene, we do not see evidence, despite the, the land bridges, of species being able to disperse across Sumatra. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge funding and collaborators at UTA and in Indonesia and take any questions.